Now, an important factor in our pursuit of pure products is actually being on the ground where we source our oils. This is critical when it comes to long-term sustainability and quality. Having the chance to go to Guatemala myself, I've seen firsthand how these direct partnerships with our cardamom farmers, growers, and distillers are life-changing for everyone involved in this beautiful supply chain. Nobody knows this better than our direct sourcing team. Historically, essential oils have been brought to the market through brokers. Uh, companies have reached out to a broker and said, I need this oil. The broker uh, works all of his channels to find whatever oils he can and then sells them to the company and, and sells them as pure oils. And so the company will then sell those oils to the consumer, oftentimes thinking that they're pure oils. But when they've gone through a broker, you never quite know what's happened. One of the real challenges in the world of essential oil has been connecting the end customer with the farmer. Okay, there's, there's the middlemen that create challenges. And with doTERRA, we're the only one in between, right? We work directly with the farmers, then it's doTERRA, and then it's the consumer. When you have other people in between, you, you know, the farmer may get taken advantage of. A small-scale farmer that is producing an essential oil crop in a country typically doesn't have any kind of contract commitment for what they're producing. They also are relying usually on very limited information and market information. A, a tremendous amount of risk of not knowing who's going to buy your crop, but then also having to invest your own resources, and in many cases being paid often you know, weeks, months, or even years after they have delivered the crops that they've produced. We're trying to reverse these limiting factors for small-scale farmers, which we do so by providing prepayments where those are empowering for the farmers, providing long-term guaranteed purchase commitments to our distillers that they then can provide onward to the cooperatives with whom they're working with. As we look at sourcing oils, right, we, we want to be at the source. One of the ways we could do that is to just purchase a large farm. And we could purchase a large farm, hire three or four people, and, and we could manage the farm and produce pure oils, right? But if we do that, we're not blessing people's lives. We're not helping people. It's these artists and farmers, these people for generations have had family farms. And we don't want to put any of these people out of business. They know how to do it. They know how to do it in a way that produces the best oils. They, they cultivate the plants. They care for the plants. And when it comes out of a commercial farm, it just doesn't have the same impact. And certainly we're not blessing as many lives. We do this through working globally, having a sourcing team that is working very hard and present and even many case, most cases living within the region where they are sourcing, overseeing sourcing and establishing relationships with these distillers that we have spent many years uh, meeting, learning and partnering with. One of the keys with going direct to source is to know who we're working with and making sure that the grower is receiving the money that we're paying for the oil. You know, we, we buy an oil and if we buy it from a broker, then, you know, you don't know where the money is eventually going or is the, if the end farmer is getting it. That's why we don't deal with brokers. In, in Guatemala years ago, when we were beginning to source cardamom, I was talking to growers of cardamom and I was talking to them and I said we want to work with you and they said well what about the coyotes and the coyotes are people who would come around and they were just brokers who were buying oil and and taking advantage of the farmers and I said our goal is to eliminate coyotes and they said I remember one of the growers said oh that's gonna be very difficult to do and I said well at doTERRA, we like to do hard things. So we're going to eliminate the coyotes and we're going to work directly with those who harvest the cardamom. And that's exactly what we've done over the past six years. I think we've all heard the saying, if you want something done right, then do it yourself. Being on the ground with our farmers, it's not that we're actually doing it ourselves, but we have the ability to influence what most companies can't or won't or quite frankincensely don't. 
Now, all jokes aside, it's the job of our sourcing team to make certain we have these beautiful partnerships and long-term sustainable sourcing. Pretty easy, right? It's not, but Tim Valentiner and his team lead this incredible crusade to ensure we have the best of the best provided by the thousands of partner farmers from Bulgaria to Madagascar and all the way back around. Direct sourcing and forming long-term partnerships are central to doTERRA sourcing strategy. We are excited to introduce you today to some of the people who are making this happen around the world. From Bulgaria, Plama Nikolov, our general manager of Esoteri Bulgaria. From Kenya, Taylor McKay, strategic sourcing manager for Sub-Saharan Africa. From Australia, Emily Bell, strategic sourcing manager for the Oceania and Asia regions. And from Southern Italy, Cecilia Spinelli, a long-term citrus partner with us. Today we want to talk about why we intentionally direct source our essential oil and how this sourcing strategy is critically important in our pursuit of purity and all that goes into making that happen. Plowman, can you first talk to us a bit about how adulteration typically happens in the essential oil industry in Bulgaria and, and how we are doing it very differently in terms of how we are sourcing and working directly with farmers through Esoteri? Yes, uh, we all know that um, adulteration happens and uh, actually I can divide the time here in Bulgaria as uh, the time before Esoteri and the time after Esoteri. Uh, this is a very simple line. Uh, before Esoteri, I know that doTERRA was looking for partners or distillers who are eventually on the same level of, of understanding the essential oils and partners doTERRA can uh, rely on, and that was not possible. I can talk about Melissa and Trolls oil as an example of, uh, uh, of, of frequently ad um, adulteration. Uh, and the reason is very simple. These are expensive oils and, and every uh, distiller and farmer actually uh, is tempted to, to, to ad adulterate these oils. But, uh, mm, and, and, and finally, uh, as doTERRA learned that this is, it is impossible to find, uh, to find a reliable partners, uh, a reliable pa partner, um, doTERRA decided to establish Esoteri. That was the direct reason of it. And um, Esoteri is an instrument to change the, the industry and the, start, uh, the standards in the industry in Bulgaria. To actually create a, a new standard, right? A new standard, yeah, yes. We really had a difficult time finding partners that aligned with our priorities of purity, of ensuring that we're very getting the best quality, but really the focus on farmers and ensuring that they were the, the central part of everything we were doing, that it was a farmer-focused operation first and foremost. And without really having any partners that share that vision, we realized we had to do it ourselves, um, but to set a new standard um, that, that has now really created, uh, raised the bar for all, everyone else that's functioning in Bulgaria now currently. Exactly. And uh, uh, it was the logical step by um, establishing uh, own company, 100% own company in B Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the life uh, uh, of Esoteri after that is very, very, very clear and very logical. We started to, uh, we started to um, establish long-term relations to, to farmers. The oils we distill at Esoteri are lavender, melissa, yarrow, and we partner with, uh, with uh, important uh, rose distilleries. Uh, in the meantime, while uh, the uh, construction of our own rose distilleries uh, still running, and we are expecting to be ready for the 2021 uh, season of campaign of the rose. Yeah, we are all very excited for Terra Rosa to be completed and to be able to have that the crowning jewel of essential oils from Bulgaria be the rose oil and, and being distilled ourselves through Esoteri. It's gonna be very exciting next year. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much, Plamen. It's truly been a transformative effort in how these oils are sourced in Bulgaria. And Plamen, Esoteri is the amazing place that it is today uh, because of your incredible leadership and the amazing Esoteri team who worked tirelessly to prioritize purity, but also farmers first. 
Uh, the journey for how Satori was born and what it is accomplishing today is honestly a story worth a lengthy book. Uh, it's amazing to, to think back where we were just five years ago, and we hope that all of you have the chance, the opportunity at some point to visit Esoteri on a co sourcing trip or an incentive trip to see all of this happening firsthand. So thank you again, Plamen. Welcome. Now we've been hearing this morning how rampant adulteration is in the essential oil industry. And Emily, I, I want to switch to you uh, for a little bit on this topic. You've been involved in the essential oil industry for some years now, including working prior to doTERRA with a distiller that supplies us with a beautiful essential oil, but also focuses on very large fragrance industry clients. Um, tell us a little bit about your past work and what root causes you've seen that lead to adulteration and how prevalent it is currently. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Tim. Um, indeed, I pre previously worked for one of the Terra's um, partner distiller here, here in Australia before I joined uh, the Terra and the sourcing team. So I can say that I witnessed firsthand, um, you know, how serious uh, the Terra is about um, sourcing pure and, and natural oils and having to do that, um, meaning working directly with, with partners on the ground. Because the fact is that to avoid any risk, um, you can't be buying any oils from, from brokers because you um, might face, you know, potentially be uh, supplied with adul adulterated oils that, you know, they would have done that for their own benefit. So, yeah, working directly on the ground with, with the partners is, is definitely key. So when I worked there, I did um, deal with a lot of uh, large fragrance companies uh, as well. And um, even though both aromatherapy and, and fragrance companies um, tend to aim to source sustainable products, I also saw that um, the fragrance industry is, um, is much more focused on the aroma of the oil rather than, um, you know, compared to purity or, or, the, or the chemical composition. And so it was a bit like the aroma always had to be very standardized. So if there was a slight difference between, you know, one from one batch to the other, um, that could be an issue for, for the end product. So I'm not going to say that fragrance companies um, actually promote, you know, adulteration of, of oils, but it is a fact that they use a lot of um, biotech alternatives or ingredients or um, synthetic molecule isolates, um, all these kind of things, which really, you know, give that, that, standard, um, that standard aroma. So for the fragrance companies, um, sourcing pure and natural oils like we do in aromatherapy is not the most important things, um, I believe. The reality is that we are very different and because we're working with natural products from nature, this means that natural variation should be expected. And so a lavender bottle now from this past harvest season should have a slight aroma difference from the lavender that's harvested next season or the following season. And quite frankly, if you buy uh, uh, an essential oil and it, it smells and looks and tastes and feels the same for the next 10 years, you should be worried because it means that uh, it's likely not pure and natural because natural variation is, is part of the chemistry and part of what nature produces. Um, thanks so much, Emily, uh, for, for your insights and background from what you did prior to doTERRA and obviously love everything you're doing with us and for us as our, uh, as our lead in, in the Oceania and Asia regions and all the beautiful oils that are coming from those areas. And most importantly, the partnerships that, that, that you're fostering and, and, and continuing to develop there. Essential oils are, are part of a very complex and nuanced industry indeed, um, with many end users such as flavor and fragrance companies, but also aromatherapy. So it's, it is fascinating to understand that, that as these different industries prioritize different objectives, they have varying levels of tolerance for adulteration and standardization, which can lead to oils being mislabeled, being impure, and as a result at times less potent. But of course, uh, we... We, of course, have very specific objectives of purity and potency. And as a result, we've established a global botanical network of partner distillers and even our own distilleries like Esoteri when needed to ensure we can always get what we need, which are pure and potent oils. 
Cecilia and her family run a multi-generational citrus oil operation in the you know, very southern part of the country. And one of the oils that they produce and have done for, for many, many years is bergamot. Um, bergamot is, of course, is an amazing oil used primarily for aromatherapy, um, but unfortunately is one of the most commonly adulterated essential oils. Cecilia, can you tell us a little bit about bergamot oil from Italy and why adulteration, unfortunately, is, is so common with this oil? Our family company works with a vast network of citrus farmers in Italy to provide to doTERRA so special and so fabulous citrus essential oils, including lemon, bergamot, orange, mandarin, and other citrus oils. In the case of bergamot, one of the main chemical components sold from bergamot is called linalol. Unfortunately, linalol is so easy to isolate and produce synthetically, which means that many companies adulterate bergamot essential oil by adding linalol to spike it or to extend it instead of supplying pure essential bergamot oil. It's actually very sad how much bergamot oil is adulterated. Um, for example, in Italy, uh, there is an estimated 300 metric tons of pure bergamot oil produced annually, yet 1,000 metric tons of bergamot oil get sold on the global market. Those numbers don't line up very well, of course. And this means that uh, there is a lot of pure bergamot oil that is extended or adulterated and then sold to whoever is willing to buy it, whether they know that it is adulterated or not. Um, this means that basically 700 metric tons of bergamot oil being sold on the market is not actually pure. If, if, if the estimates are around 300 tons per year and 1,000 are being sold, that's coming from somewhere. And, and it's so sad to see that level of adulteration happening for an oil that's so precious and important as bergamot. Um, it's disturbing for transparency reasons, but also safety. Can you tell us a little bit about how this affects the bergamot market, this type of practice of, of adulteration? This is a big problem because it crowds out honest distillers like us. Uh, we don't cheat or cut corners. This means that we need to purchase a massive volume of bergamot fruit to produce pure essential oil. And this is difficult when the prices are set so high artificially. It's so important for us to understand how oil adulteration ultimately cheats not only the consumers, but it hurts the farmers who are so dependent on what they produce for their livelihood and how we need to continue to educate the world about this. Now for our last questions, Taylor, you are based currently in Kenya and oversee our clove bud oil that is coming from Madagascar, where unfortunately as well, essential oil adulteration practices are widespread. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that uh, in the Madagascan context, but also uh, about clove in particular? Yeah, thanks, Tim. So Clove, clove is unique in the fact that the clove tree has three distinct plant parts uh, that have different chemical profiles. So you have clove bud, clove stem, and clove leaf. And oftentimes these are distilled together uh, or blended together afterwards despite their chemistries being quite different. And then they're sold as a package deal as a, as a pure clove bud essential oil. Uh, in a minute, I think we'll be learning a bit more about this in a new video that describes just how complicated the clove industry is, uh, particularly in Madagascar. But what I think is important here is to focus on doTERRA's approach to direct sourcing of clove bud 
through our trusted partners uh, and distillers. This approach, as Ben alluded to earlier and many of the panelists have spoken about, really helps us ensure that we are indeed receiving 100% pure clove bud oil versus something else. Uh, because like I, like I mentioned, what is normally traded and sold or often traded and sold as pure bud oil is almost always an adulterated version of clove stem or even clove uh, leaf oil that's, that's mixed and blended together. Um, in fact, I think after all the work that we and our partners have been doing on the ground in Madagascar for the past several years, um, we're pretty convinced that we're likely the only company in the world that's actually able to say with confidence that our clove bud oil is actually truly clove bud oil and not something else. It, it's also encouraging to know that we can have confidence in the purity of doTERRA's clove bud oil and the good we are doing for the farmers by prioritizing pure oil and paying even a premium for it. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, so one of the challenges that exists in the market uh, is that most testing labs usually don't have the capability uh, to really distinguish clove bud, pure bud, um, from adulterated oil, particularly when it's coming from even the same tree, but just different plant parts. Uh, but we're pioneering the way for customers to feel confident in the purity of the oils that they're receiving. Uh, we're not only ensuring this purity through direct sourcing with farmers and distillers uh, by being right at the ground and at the source, uh, but also, of course, through our state-of-the-art third-party labs uh, who provide testing for adulteration, and then, of course, our own internal um, quality control procedures to ensure CPTG uh, standards are kept. Thanks, Taylor. Again, all these practices help us to source the best and help the most. The results of this hard work coming together to ensure that we truly have the potency of pure clove bud oil, when very likely no other company can say and verify the same. Um, and this has indeed been an amazing uh, journey as we've tried to understand so much about clove bud. I want to say thank you so much to each of our panelists for being with us. And as Taylor mentioned, please stay tuned for the premiere of our first episode of the new series, The Pursuit which takes a deeper dive into what we've been talking about here today in terms of Madagascar and clove bud, but also why direct sourcing is absolutely important to everything we're doing with our sourcing strategy. Tim's team will be back tomorrow to share more about the impact we're making globally. But there's a reason we travel the world in pursuit of the purest essential oils. You've seen the other oils. They've been changed, cheapened, synthesized. They've been adulterated. There are 18 tribes scattered across our island. We all call ourselves Malagasy, but our customs and way of life vary from place to place. Here in Mananzari, we are members of the Atambawoka tribe, the smallest tribe in Madagascar. The ocean is our lifeblood here in Mananzari. We rely on the water for everything from fishing and hunting to plant cultivation. We are surrounded on one side by salt water and fresh water on the other. Some of our largest exports are coffee, vanilla, and a variety of essential oil crops like vetiver, cinnamon, and clove. <laughs> There are two large exporters here, and countless farmers run in there on small distilleries. In this area alone, there are more than 80 small-scale distilleries. Ah! 
My name is Joseph Claudius. I've been a farmer here in Mananzari for seven years now. My wife Rosine and I moved here after getting married, and we began farming coffee and rice. We have a simple life here on the outskirts of Manandar. Each morning, Claudius feeds the chickens and prepares our tools while I fetch water and cook breakfast. We live in a small community of close family where we all take care of each other. We have a young son named Claudio. He's seven years old. He always says that he wants to be a doctor when he grows up. Claudio's education is very important to us. Up until a few years ago, we were still only planting coffee and rice, but that wasn't enough. We started planting clove trees, which provided an additional income we could use to send Claudio to school. There are no doctors this far away from the city. If someone needs to visit the doctor, it can be difficult to find transportation. We hope that by sending Claudio to school, he will someday have the opportunity to open a clinic in our area. Planting clove isn't enough to make us rich, but it does get Claudio his education and also allows us to save for the future. Many farmers live far outside of the city, and it's hard for them to transport their product to the market where they can be sold. Because of this, we've seen traders begin to appear in Mananzad, men who travel from farmer to farmer buying out their stock and taking it to the market. Middlemen are the biggest challenge. A trader might go to a farmer and buy out his stock of clove, and then sell it in the city market for double the buying price. If the farmer doesn't sell, he risks his supply spoiling, so he is forced to make a deal. Using some basic chemistry, a trader can pad their profits even further. For a trader, it can be immensely profitable to adulterate an essential oil. When it comes to clove, for example, there are three parts of the plant from which oil is acquired. The stem, the leaf, and the bud. All three oils contain the same chemical compounds, but the amounts of each compound vary from one oil to another. The most desirable chemical compound in clove is eugenol acetate. Its levels are highest in the clove bud. Essential oil derived from the bud is naturally the most valuable, being worth double the clove stem and quadruple the clove leaf. To some buyers, high quality oil isn't a priority. In that kind of scenario, they may seek out a cheaper clove oil. The real problem comes when a customer asks for one thing and is given another. There's little access to chemical testing equipment in Madagascar, so international buyers often don't know if their essential oils are pure until they're personally tested. The highest quality clove oil is around 15% eugenol acetate. There are many ways to mix oils to increase profits. Some methods are as simple as mixing clove bud with clove stem. 
We can keep using acetate levels within the buyer's expectations and they'd never know. Another method is to add synthetic eugenol acetate directly to clove leaf or stem. To even a sophisticated lab, it would look like clove bud oil. The difference between pure and synthetic is almost undetectable. Naturally, most sellers claim their oils are pure, and it would be difficult to prove them wrong. To give our buyers confidence in the oil we produce, we ship our essential oils to one of the only labs on the island, in Antananarivo, our nation's capital. The tests we run in this lab are not comprehensive, but it gives our buyers some base levels to go off of. When essential oils arrive here at doTERRA, we do a series of tests to confirm the purity of the oils. At the Quality Control Lab, we use an extensive protocol to ensure the purity. One of the most common tools in the industry is the GCMS, which is used to identify each individual chemical compound present in the oils. It shows the natural composition of the oil, and we also use it to check for adulteration and contamination with chemicals that are not naturally present in the oils. GCMS by itself is not enough to ensure purity. This is why at Otera we have additional testing that looks at organoleptic and physical properties of the oils. The last thing we do is to make sure the oils are free of contaminants, such as heavy metals, pesticides and microorganisms. Because our sourcing team works closely with our suppliers and quality is ensured at the source, we rarely see adulteration. All around the world, farmers are dependent on oil producers for their livelihood. Clades and Rosine represent hundreds of thousands of farmers who work hard to provide an education and future opportunities for their children. These farmers are at the heart of the essential oil industry. Welcome everybody. It's important to understand why quality and purity are so vital and worth striving for. As we hear over and over, quality matters, and it starts long before seeds are planted. Knowing this, it's imperative for doTERRA to be as close to the source as possible. Of equal importance to doTERRA is our scientific and medical communities. It's an honor to be hosting a discussion about quality and why quality matters with esteemed experts in the field today. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's go ahead and do a few introductions. Uh, Mark joining us from Austin, Texas. Thank you so much. Would you like to introduce yourself? Well, hi, thank you for including me. My name is Mark Blumenthal. I'm the founder and executive director of the American Botanical Council. We're an independent nonprofit research and education organization uh, made up of scientists, health professionals, and herb experts from around the world, and we uh, focus on research and education on herbs, medicinal plants, uh, botanical extracts, essential oils, um, medicinal fun fungi and mushrooms, et cetera. So we are a science organization. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. And it, we're excited to have you here on the panel today. Uh, Dr. Satyal. Hello everyone. I'm Prabodh Satyal, Chief Scientific Officer for Aromatic Plant Research Center, APRC. I received my doctorate master's degree on essential oil research in University of Alabama, Huntsville. I've been doing essential oil research like, you know, it's closer to more than 10 years. And what has your research been focused on primarily? My, most of the research are focused on adulteration, okay. discovery of synthetic marker, and chirality-based adulteration detection. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And those are the things that helps to, you know, decipher adulteration on, in those time, you know, so. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, well, thanks for having me here. Thank you. Dr. Yeah. Osgothorpe. Great to be here, Andrew. 
My name is Russ Osgathorpe. I am the Chief Medical Officer at doTERRA and by training a Pediatric Infectious Diseases Specialist. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we just watched the first episode of the new series, uh, The Pursuit, uh, which will document the great lengths our sourcing team goes to to sustainably source the purest essential oils on the planet. Uh, this episode, of course, was about clove, which, as we've seen, is uh, frequently and unfortunately adulterated. Dr. Osgathorpe, reflect a little bit on the, on the video. I agree. It's very important to us here at doTERRA. The story is a fantastic example of uh, how adulteration finds its way without being very careful, can find its way into our homes. Yeah, like Dr. Osgothorpe said, Clovebird is one of the most adulterated essential oil. And in the last year, I did market survey of several retail you know, suppliers. I found more than 90% were adulterated. Getting rid of adulteration in supply chains across the world, not just for doTERRA, but for everybody, is important work. And uh, speaking of adulteration, Mark, I, I read with interest your organization's recent bulletin published yeah. in early July uh, with regards to the adulteration of English lavender, uh, Lavendula angustifolia, uh, which is, of course, the, the lavender that doTERRA loves. And uh, can you elaborate on this study, its findings uh, for us a little bit, please? Yes, thank you. It's part of our program, that's, which is going into its 10th year of operation soon, called the Botanical Adulterants Prevention Program, which is an international consortium of organizations that we lead dealing with research and education on adulteration and fraud in the global marketplace for herbs, uh, herbal extracts, essential oils, et cetera. Uh, we've previously published a, a bulletin on the adulteration of tea tree oil, a lab guidance document on tea tree oil, and then in July of this year, we just published the uh, bulletin on, on uh, lavender. The Blavender Bulletin has been extensively peer-reviewed by 25 experts in the area of chemistry of medicinal plants and essential oils, people in academia, government, and industry uh, in the United States and around the world. So it is a highly credible document. It has over 101 references to it, and it's basically a scientific bulletin or almost like a technical white paper. Uh, that is very extensive, showing the types of adulteration of English lavender, the chemistry, what the evidence for the adulteration is, with many references based on the chemistry and previous uh, reports that have been published in book chapters and in scientific journals about adulteration of lavender. So if anybody ever doubted whether lavender or English lavender was ever adulterated, we have definitively confirmed that it is being adulterated, which is really no surprise to many of us. But some, some people suggest that over 50%, maybe 70 or more percent of the uh, world's stock of so-called lavender is actually adulterated in one way or another. Yeah. Th thoughts on that, Dr. Oskathorpe? Well, I, I mean, yes, I have so many thoughts on that. Yeah. It drives me crazy that um, lavender, which is used by hundreds of millions of people every day, uh, across the world in a plethora of products. Um, they just don't know what they're using. Yeah. Um, we have done with uh, both APRC as well as doTERRA uh, partnerships with NCNPR at the University of Mississippi, similar uh, studies on adulteration and have found that up to two thirds of the lavenders currently on the market marketed as essential oils, not just products containing lavender, but the essential oils on the market, two thirds of them are highly adulterated and of, and of poor quality. It is important to know what it is that you're using. doTERRA goes to exceptional lengths to make it clear to everyone what you're using. We publish and source to you the GCMS of each lot of lavender that we sell you. We get rid of many, many totes, huge batches of lavender that don't meet our quality specifications or that are adulterated. Tim Valentiner and his team go to exceptional lengths of making sure that our supply chains are full of quality lavender rather than adulterated lavender. I can't say this really strongly enough. We as an industry have to clean up ourselves because nobody's watching. So doTERRA's doing it right. Yeah. Very few people in the industry are. Yeah. 
and we should call it out when yeah. we see it. Absolutely. And so these publications that the American Botanical Council, that APRC, that NCNPR are doing are all playing a role in helping everyone around the world to understand how adulteration affects us. Yeah, and, and Mark, how is your, uh, y the bulletins that you're uh, putting out, how is it being received? People tell us in various companies that they have reset and revised specifications for various uh, ingredients, botanical ingredients, based on our adulteration reports and consequently have often changed their suppliers, presumably to a better supplier, because of the information they've learned from us about adulteration. So we're, we believe we're having a positive impact, which in the long run, at the end of the day, is good for the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yep, a report like that has to be produced a lot, you know? Yeah. Not yeah. only Lavender, I was asking him to, you know, make more. Yeah. Yeah, there are yeah. a lot of problems on industry. I know last year you, you conducted a market study on, on Lavender. Mark alluded somewhere yeah. between 50 and 70 percent on the market, uh, potentially being adulterated. What was sort of the findings for your market study that you conducted? We did on 50 companies. Yeah. Around 78% were adulterated. I know we, we uh, are very proud of our partnerships. You alluded to the NCNPR uh, partnership, which is the uh, National Center for Natural Products Research right. at the University of Mississippi. Uh, how's that partnership going, Dr. Oscar? Oh, it's phenomenally well. We've had a great year with them. So yeah. we're working on similar research to what the American Botanical Council with Mark and what APRC has done with Lavender. We're also um, helping to fund and support research into lavender adulteration. In that research, what they're doing at NCNPR is using doTERRA's uh, oil as the gold standard for what a quality oil should look like. And this body of work, which will be peer reviewed and published, will greatly en enhance the field and, and everyone's ability to uh, detect adulteration as well as root it out of the supply chain. A couple of years ago, there were some scientific reports made with regards to lavender uh, that caused some concern with our customers and the general public. The issue in question was that lavender was causing uh, breast development in young boys. Specifically, the study mentioned that boys were exposed to lavender fragrance containing products such as colognes, shampoos, and soaps. Mark, I know you've studied this issue and that your organization is preparing to release a paper soon uh, on this issue. And uh, would you like to kind of elaborate a little bit on that for us? Yes, thank you. And let me just say that the paper has not been completed. We're waiting for some more laboratory tests. It has not yet been submitted to a peer-reviewed journal. So we always want to be careful about discussing something before it's been peer-reviewed. So basically what we have is misreporting in the medical literature by well-meaning people who are uh, clinicians or uh, basically reporting what they saw and they see that the person that the kids were taking uh, or bathing with lavender fragrance materials, which when they took the materials away, some of these symptoms stopped. So there was a definitely a certain association that may be causal related to these materials, but they did not contain, in the best of our knowledge, any essential oil of lavender, but may have contained some synthetic uh, lavender type fragrances as well as any other types of materials that might you find in cosmetics. So it's difficult to really pinpoint what the putatively offensive material might be, but it's not essential of lavender to the best of our knowledge. Yeah, I agree with you, Mark. I, I agree that if you're gonna implicate a particular ingredient in a long list of ingredients in a product, you should prove that that ingredient is there before you write the article. Well, thanks, uh, Mark, for all of the, the great work that you're doing at the American Botanical Council. Agreed. And uh, we really appreciate kind of you, you pioneering uh, these efforts for so many years. Uh, Probode, uh, quality and purity, uh, why does this matter for the customer? Because when you go and buy in market, when you, when you are going to buy apple, don't buy the orange, you know. Yeah. Because most of the essential oil companies are selling their oils are 100% pure and natural, but they are not, yeah. you know. And you are being cheated by the, you know, retailer or seller. Yeah. So that's not fair, you know. Like Dr. Osgothorpe thinks adulteration is criminal. Yeah. I do also think the same way, you know. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, con conclude us uh, here today, Dr. Osgothorpe. I think the reason that it matters, Andrew, is it's a safety issue. Yeah. 
If you don't know what you're putting on or into your bodies, you could potentially be doing harm. Knowing what is in the bottle is the foundation of safety. Thank you, and thank you all for, for joining us here today. Uh, this has been a fantastic and insightful discussion. And what separates doTERRA in this industry is our pursuit and commitment to purity. We hold ourselves, our supply lines, and our products to the highest standards. And every oil in every batch is 100% pure, guaranteed by our rigorous testing process. And of course, as we, we've seen today, the fantastic uh, team in the field, uh, there being as close to the source as possible. And now uh, we're, we're gonna take you into the lab to help you understand the meticulous and painstaking efforts, as Dr. Oscarthorpe laid out, uh, that doTERRA goes to in order to bring you pure and efficacious products. All right, guys, so we're here at the doTERRA lab, and this is where we test all of our oils to make sure that the chemistry is optimal and there are no contaminants. Now, we run this several different times along the manufacturing process, just to be sure. You can never be too sure. But that, my friends, is the Certified Pure Therapeutic Grade Difference, also known as CPTG. Now, speaking of C, I see Cecile here, and she's somebody who understands this a lot more than me. We're grateful to have you, Cecile. Ça va bien? Très bien, et toi, how are you? I'm very good. But talk to us, my friend, what do you have for us today? Today, I would like to show you the labs. We have three different labs, and I'd like to start with a chemistry lab. It's where we test for the natural composition of the oils and also potential contamination. Would you like to go and see it? I'd love to. Let's go. Let's go. Dakota. Hey, how's it going? Fantastic. All right, so Cecile told me that you would take care of us as far as understanding physical testing and what that means. Totally. Can you enlighten us? Definitely. So every oil that comes through the chemistry lab first has to undergo a series of physical tests. So we'll look at things like appearance, color, aroma, very basic physical properties to make sure that the essential oil is pure. Um, after these tests, we will take them through a series of instruments that will give us a next level of understanding, um, again, to evaluate their purity so that we can catch anything before it goes on to the next step. And the next step is GCMS. Exactly. So all of this is happening way before GCMS. It is. I got to check this out. All right, guys, so we just got done with physical testing. Now we're on to the next phase, which is GCMS. We have Beatrice here. She's our expertise. Um, really simply, what is GCMS? GCMS is a test that we do that tells us the content of the oil specifically. What it does is we put the oil into the GCMS and it runs through this column that is really long and really, really thin. And it helps us separate the oil into individual compounds that will show us as it detects it here in a mess bag, what it looks like. And all these peaks will tell us what it is as we compare them to a standard library that we have of known spectra. And then we'll have a report that will come out called the chromatograph. Okay, so we basically break down each oil into its individual components, yes. and then we're able to compare that to a validated database where we understand the exact benchmark we're looking for. Exactly. Here's a question for you. What if we know or we see that a oil doesn't meet that benchmark. If that happens, then we'll have an investigation open, and then our quality assurance department will start to review the whole process. But we also have a lot of different tests that we do that would help us solidify, and we can go check that out, actually. Let's go. So right here, we have the ICPMS. And the GCMS is nice. It gives us what we want to know in an oil, whereas the ICPMS shows us what we don't want in an oil, like harmful substances like lead or mercury, things like that. So our sample will get dissolved in very concentrated acid. It dissolves it, and so it's easy for us to run through the plasma beam, and it will then separate and get detected on the detector. And then we will see the concentration of each of these elements. Okay. So what I understand is GCMS alone is not enough. So by implementing this technology, we're able to ensure quality and safety even more. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you for your time. I've learned a lot but I'm gonna go find Cecile because I think there's still a lot more we need to get into. Thank you. All right. Hi, Simone, how is it? It was good. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, there were a lot of details, but I pretty much got it all down. Awesome. I'd like to show you more. We have the EM lab here. EM is for environmental monitoring. 
we test the water, we test the air and also the surfaces just to make sure everything is clean in the manufacturing process. Robert, how's it going, my man? All right, how are you? Good, I'm good. So I was just with Cecile and uh, she mentioned that we test water, surface levels and air samples. I gotta be honest with you. I don't fully understand why we're testing water. Well, the water doesn't go into our products, but it does touch our equipment surfaces during the cleaning process. So we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're not like getting anything, any contamination into our product because they are product contact surfaces. Got so pro product will come in contact with those surfaces. So we want to make sure that they're clean and good to go. It makes sense, it makes sense. And I imagine that's the same with the surface level test that we run? Yes, we do a swab uh, uh, sampling technique where we, the, the surfaces are swabbed, uh, put into a neutralizing broth, and we uh, will test this broth for uh, the various tests we want to run on it. Very consistent as well with all these tests. Correct. Awesome. Air samples. Air samples, yes. The air samples we collect using these dual head air samplers, and we just want to make sure that the air in the manufacturing environment is good to go. So, so it kind of covers all, all of our bases. Makes sense to me. Okay. So, in addition to all the other tests that we do, this is just an additional safeguard that we put into place. Correct. We yes. check water, we check surface levels, we check air samples. I'm going to check you out later, but thank you so much, Robert. All right. Appreciate you. Have a good day. Okay, so I knew there were a lot of steps to this. I didn't know there were that many steps, but we're going for quality, so I'm all for it. Yes, well, I have one more stop for you. Here we have the micro lab. That's where we test the products at the beginning of the, of the manufacturing and at the end. So we test for potential contamination with bacteria, uh, yeast, and fungi. And Pretty Banana is going to show you around. Awesome. Merci. Pretty, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good. So Cecile explained that this is one of the final steps before the product ends up in our hands. So that's a pretty important step. Can you explain to us kind of a breakdown of what happens before we receive the product? So this is the microbiology lab and we test for the microbial contamination if it's to happen. So for example, over here you can see Brady is sampling all those samples to test for the microbial contamination. And this is a product, bergamot mint oil, yeah. which is going to be tested against bacterial and eastern mold and staph, pseudomonas, E. coli, and salmonella test. Wow, so that's a lot of testing. I mean, we're running tests way before, right? But this is just another safeguard that we put into place to ensure that there's absolutely no contamination. Exactly. Awesome, so I see you have an example. Yes. So this is to show our viewer that if there's nothing on the plate, that means like no growth. Like you cannot see anything, right? But if there is some microbial contamination and you can see a plate look like this. So this is our positive control and this is our negative control. Well, I know you got a lot of work to do. And you look very busy. So I'm gonna leave you to that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for what you do. And we'll see you later. All right, Cecile, so we understand there's a lot of work to be done. We're gonna end this right here, but thank you so much for the behind the scenes look. That's incredible to see the amount of work and steps that are being put forth just to ensure quality. Absolutely, you're so welcome. I was very happy to show you. It's true, we have a great team of scientists here. They make sure our oils are pure, are free of contamination. For sure, for sure. And so I know I speak on behalf of everybody watching from home. Thank you guys for everything that you guys do. Thank you, Simon, it was right. a pleasure. We'll see you. I trust doTERRA oils because before doTERRA, I was like many people using oils that were at the store. I didn't really realize that um, there was no standard in the essential oil industry. I kind of thought, well, if it says it's 100% pure essential oil, then that must be what it is. The fact that they have a third party test all of their oils and that you can go in and look that up is really reassuring to us to know that what we're putting in our body is exactly what we think it is. And knowing that they do that, like, I'm not worried about using essential oils through doTERRA. So I trust the source. CPTG certified peer therapeutic grade. We are guaranteed 
pure and potent oils. When I started doing some digging and doing my research around doTERRA, I started to realize that their standards, their purity, their transparency around exactly what's in the bottle and who farmed it and all of those details that we're really transparent about and that was really reassuring to me. I wanted to know what these bottles could do for my son, for my family. And ultimately, it became something that not only I helped my family with, but I've helped other families with. I'm a believer. I have to believe in something. You, you, you don't sell me something. I have to believe in something. And so when I saw her belief in that and how she started to utilize it with her patients, well, then that's when I started to come around myself and, and, and start to, to learn more and more and, and start to integrate it personally within the, my practice. I feel safe, I feel empowered. I just know that what I'm giving my children is wonderful. Whether you're a weekend warrior or whether you're a professional athlete, these products and oils will actually do wonders for the body. I don't know where I would be without these essential oils and products. I went to where doTERRA sources peppermint and Roman chamomile. It was a, two brothers. One brother was distilling and one was out in the farms. And I specifically asked them why they only worked with doTERRA. And they said, because they treat us like family. I trust that everyone has been treated well along the supply chain. I trust that everyone has been paid fairly. And that for me is extremely important, the way that we source our oils. And so my heart every day is grateful for doTERRA, what it's done for our family and my health and what they're doing also around the world to change lives of the growers bringing them to us. It's pretty phenomenal. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this, it's that people are at the heart of everything we do. It's been this way from the very beginning. We source our oils the way we do because it builds communities. We make sure every bottle is pure because you use oils and your loved ones use them. It may not be the easy way, but it's the right way. But we're just getting started. There's so much more to look forward to this afternoon and tomorrow. Dr. Hill's gonna walk you through the cycle of immunity and we'll see the specific essential oils you use each day to build up your immunity. When you build up your immunity, you can then build up your community. You know what I'm saying? We'll also go to unveil the latest research on doTERRA on guard that might be surprising to the world, but they're things we suspected for years. We'll see you this afternoon at 2 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Mm -hmm.